I have some great HOA stories for you today, and you're going to love that title story too. Here's our first one. This story takes place in a glorious HOA. Don't sue. We'll let you come onto our property to fix your sewer line, posted by Hope We Sink. The house that I grew up in was built on the side of a hill. Great views, but the geography posed some challenges for the city utilities, sewage in particular. Their solution was to put all the houses on the hill in what was called a shared line. Essentially, one big pipe ran through all of our backyards, just below the house's basements. Effluent would flow out from the houses into the shared pipe and then down the hill to the city sewer line by the bottommost house. When we moved in, we were at the highest point that it was possible to build on and still be part of that shared sewer line. But a few years later, someone bought a lot just over the crest of the hill and linked up with ours without being part of the planned community that had an HOA that took care of the sewer line, among other things. And in fact, they did so without the HOA's approval. And so for the next two decades, my family would be the subject of near constant harassment over the state of the sewer. Their end of the line was lower than ours by just enough that it would stop flowing and clog, often backing up into their basement bathroom and shower. They'd accuse us of diverting our effluent to their line, because I guess we were some kind of plumbing wizards. Now the reason that nobody built a house on that part of the hill during the original development was that the soil was unstable, something hydrology related. Sure enough, over the years, that house would occasionally separate from the hill and slide down a couple of inches. But our neighbors had connections in the code enforcement agency, so the place never got condemned like it should be. They just had to shore it up and reconnect all the utilities. The thing is, the further down the house moved, the steeper the negative incline was from their sewer connection to our junction box, making the clogs in the backup even worse. And at one point, it got so bad that their sewer barely even flowed. Some days, it got completely clogged. And somehow, this was our fault. They spent the next year calling us every time they tried to flush the toilet and crap came out of their downstairs shower. They called a plumber who said that they had to redo their part of the shared line. And to do it, they'd have to bust through our two-story masonry wall so that they could get a backhoe onto our property and dig out the line. Of course, we had issues with this. We said no, you will not come onto our property and tear it up with a big old piece of construction equipment. Hire human laborers or something. But instead, they hired lawyers who started slinging paper around. According to them, we were in violation of state law that specifically gave an implied easement granting a homeowner access through another's property to maintain their own. So we hired lawyers of our own who said that we basically had a choice. We could win the case, but pay a ton of money or just let it happen. Either way, we'd be screwed. But they pointed out one important fact, that the 20-year-old masonry wall wasn't in the greatest of shape anyway, so... A few months later, we presented them with a bill for $75,000 for the rebuilding of the wall, installation of a new set of stairs, replacement of the entire wrought iron fence that had separated the two properties, resodding, replacement of ornamental plants and shrubs, and some minor repairs to our sewer, which they had borked up while relaying their pipes. I'm not a general contractor, but my guess is that they could have hired pick and shovel labor to dig out that pipe and replace it with a new one for a fraction of that price. <laughs> but no, they had to have a giant caterpillar tread machine to do it. They balked. But then we handed them a Xerox copy of the letter that their lawyers had sent us with pursuant to paragraph blah 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 of the common code of blah blah blah, citing the next paragraph which stated that the person using the easement was 100% responsible for any damage that might be caused. They still balked, but my parents put a lien on their property that stayed there to the day that they tried to sell, at which point they had to pay up or the purchaser's creditors wouldn't underwrite a mortgage. I think they had to pay interest too, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Can you believe that OP got literally a $75,000 wall basically for free? What would have you done? OP is a loudmouth around the HOA snitch. Oh, this is not good. How would you handle it? This just happened and I feel like such a jerk. Backstory 1. 
my next door neighbors moved in two to three years ago. Initially, I was excited because they have a little boy a year younger than my son, and I remember growing up next to all my friends, and I wanted that for my son. My son back then was two or three, and I quickly got to work to baking cookies to welcome the new neighbors. We brought them over, knocked on the door, and they invited us in, and the boys played. The husband showed me the tablet that has all the camera feed from the cameras that he just installed, and the wife gave me the impression that she thought that we were in a dangerous neighborhood. <laughs> Honestly, just a normal middle class neighborhood. But whatever, let her be a worrywart. I thought they were nice. Slowly, they began to do things that annoyed the rest of us neighbors. We live in an HOA neighborhood, and they began changing their yard drastically without written consent from any of us. First, they made their driveway wider, which was fine, but then they built a literal wall in between them and the neighbors to their other side. We made jokes that they must be Trump supporters because those neighbors are more obviously Latino than us, but they were still acting nice towards me. One night, the wife told me to bring them baked goods whenever I made them, since I bake often and tend to give the majority of it to my neighbors, so I asked her. I baked a chocolate cake with hazelnut frosting and then brought them some slices. Just a really quick drop off, really. Two days later, there was a fence 10 feet high blocking their door off 10 feet away. If they just told me to not bother bringing them baked goods, I wouldn't have given them baked goods that I put a lot of work into. All of this without asking any of us. At the same time, all of us have gotten letters from the association for minor things. Brought a trailer a couple days before a trip to start packing, HOA letter. Car parked on the driveway for too long, HOA letter. Cover your car every night with a protective cover, HOA letter. Dogs, HOA letter, and animal control. So many more things. Do we have any proof that it's them? No, but are they the only new neighbors that we've had? Yes. Their son wants so badly to play with my son too. There have been times that he's run into our house and his mom doesn't even realize that he's gone. My neighbors have chased this kid down the street, the mom wandering out of her house when they've already caught him and are bringing him back. I feel so bad for him because it's not his fault his parents are jerks. So I accidentally got her number because her dog was loose and I texted the number, not knowing it was hers. I had to give him to the local animal hospital because I was waiting for over an hour for any communication and I couldn't keep him because my dogs don't like chihuahuas. After three hours, she called asking for him and saying how she saw my text earlier. If I had known it was her dog, I would have kept him. I just couldn't risk keeping him overnight. She reluctantly invited us to her son's birthday a few weeks ago. My mom asked her what she was doing for his birthday, and when she said party, she felt obligated to invite us, I guess. She then opens up texting as a means of letting the boys hang out. My other next door neighbor sells doobie roaches to pet stores and private clients. He has a pretty cool system set up and everything, all done out of his house. Today was the first day they've hung out after the party. They were playing with chalk and the little boy kept trying to run into my house, which I don't mind, but his mom minds, so my son kept having to bring him back. My son got tired and just locked the door. But guess whose garage was open? My other neighbor. The little boy ran to go into his house, but he was standing in his garage to catch him. My neighbor's really nice. He's my favorite and probably everyone else's favorite too. I saw my neighbor and the crazy child and thought about just how much my son loves bugs and just said, hey Timmy, want to see a cockroach? Behind me, the mom caught up and was like, what? And I was just so stupid that I mentioned that he has a bunch of reptiles to eat. He gives me a look and I knew I screwed up. I just told the neighborhood snitch something that I shouldn't have. I tried to later cover up when she asked probing questions because I guess she's noticed him selling something. And I told her it was only to like a couple of friends since the stores are so expensive and that he moved them out somewhere else to get them out of the house. But I fear the damage is done. Any ideas on how to distract them from contacting the HOA? People always give me ideas, but of course they got their cameras. Who do you side with, the neighbor or the OP, and what happens if the HOA finds out about this? HOA raising monthly assessments and adding fees, despite the fact that we've been under budget by 60 grand plus for the past two years by night of knee. So we bought a house in a townhome HOA in Colorado almost a year ago. There's maybe 200 townhomes in total here. 
I will admit up front that I didn't put in the time or the effort into the HOA when I first moved in, and I missed the quarterly meetings, also because I work late. Here's a brief summary of what they're doing. Effective next week, they're bringing back a parking policy from 2007 that will charge 30 bucks a month, or 360 a year, per car parked outside of our two car parking garages. Bear in mind that there is absolutely no shortage of open parking spots here every day, and the outside parking spots are completely uncovered and unsecured. It's an open community, no gates and no security. We live in a smaller town on the outskirts of Denver. This is the suburbs, not downtown Denver. The townhomes sold here are all two and three bedroom homes in a commuter neighborhood. The average household has three or four cars. The parking policy was made in 2007 when the community was built. It's a regulation, but it's not included in our CCNRs as an article, section, or attachment. The CCNRs do give the board authority to make regulations, but this regulation was not included in the CCNRs that we received as new homeowners after 2007. On top of that, this regulation has not been reviewed since 2007, and frankly, it's outdated. Due to the above parking policy, I started looking into our budget. There is no shortage of open parking spots, so I thought there might be a budgetary need for this exorbitant monthly fee. What I found out was that we were over $60,000 under budget in 2017. We're on track to be under budget for about the same in 2018, $61,000 under budget as of August 15th. The surplus funds are being put in a reserve fund that's already over a million dollars. This is what they're supposed to do with the surplus fund per our CCNRs. I'm pretty sure we're so under budget because they will not use this money for the road repairs on the HOA's private property. We're involved in a four-year-old lawsuit with the builders about the roads, so we cannot fix them with community funds. Despite being under budget for 2017 and 18, they're raising assessments in 19 from an already pricey $185 a month to $190 a month. They're raising monthly fees and adding an absorbent monthly parking fee when we're tens of thousands under budget. How can they possibly justify raising assessments and or adding this fee? So here's what I've done. I've reached out to the community manager several times since November 15th. All I'm getting in response is, your concerns have been forwarded to the board. I reached out to my neighbors via Nextdoor and I also went around putting flyers on people's windshields, advising of the upcoming changes and how to complain to the community manager. I know of at least 10 neighbors that complain to the management company and they've received the same lackadaisical response. We belong to a bigger neighborhood HOA that literally encompasses half of the town, thousands of homes, and I reached out to their manager for any advice on how to proceed with the complaint, as there is no official avenue of complaint in our CCNRs, and I'm not getting a response from the board. She just said that she doesn't really have any authority to step in. Last night, I emailed our community manager, and I requested the contact information for the lawyer for our local community association. No reply yet. So I'm going to submit a complaint to my town's government, though I don't think there's much that they can do. I'm going to submit a complaint to the Division of Real Estate for Colorado, but even they admit that they neither investigate nor enforce, so I'm not sure how helpful that'll be either. If nothing comes from either of those, I have to go around the community getting a petition signed, but there's no official petition form or process included in our CCNRs. How do I make sure that they don't ignore me or us? Any advice on how to proceed here? Anything I'm doing or not doing that could help get an answer? My ultimate goal is to get an emergency HOA meeting scheduled so that we can vote these things down. I've requested that in at least three separate emails to the community manager and the management company's general inbox. An update. I did receive an email from the community manager a couple of hours ago and the board is scheduling an emergency meeting for next week. What would you do if you were OP? This story takes place in an HOA, or at least that's what this insane Karen thinks. To give some backstory, I'm a 19 year old in a community college living in a small neighborhood in my parents old small house. I mow my own lawn, which is reasonably small because there is no HOA and I can't hire anyone to do it for me. Also the sun and exercise is great. Three of my neighbors are either elderly, don't have the time, or don't own mowers of their own, so I mow their reasonably small lawns for free at the same time that I mow mine. 
I live in a very close neighborhood, so while I may do mowing, another neighbor may power wash driveways or some such. Let's just say I mow out of the goodness of my heart, and I get compensated with a bottle of cold water afterward by two out of the three. The third, however, is where the malicious compliance begins. The third neighbor is a very stubborn 40-something-year-old lady who owns her own mower, she can afford to hire someone to do it for her, is very specific about how and when her lawn gets done even though it's free. Reason 3 ticks me off the most, honestly because she does not let me use my mower or fix hers. Seriously, it's like she's punishing me for volunteering to help her. And this mower is a piece of junk. The blades are dull, and she doesn't let me sharpen them. It's clogged full of old grass, she doesn't let me clean it. And yet, every time I ask if I can tidy it up, she snaps, quit wasting time and just get the job done. She is mean, entitled, and doesn't care that I do four lawns in one day. Even on days where I can't mow the lawn because I'm feeling under the weather or I'm just busy with school, she threatens to call the HOA, again, we don't have one, and report me for running a business without a license unless I get the lawn mowed. I'm pretty sure of three things. You don't need a license to mow a lawn, it's not a business since I don't ask for money or compensation, and that she doesn't have the number for the homeowners association that doesn't exist. I honestly should have stopped volunteering to mow her lawn a long time ago, but I just never had the heart. Except for last week. It's July, rainy and very hot, and on the morning I was scheduled to mow, it poured like a son of a bee. Now, those of you who mow lawns know, you can't, or rather shouldn't, mow your lawn directly after it rains for various reasons, and my neighborhood is pretty shaded, so it takes at least a day to dry up. So around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm just relaxing and enjoying the free time, when out of nowhere, there's a frantic smashing of a fist on my door. I would call it pounding, but it honestly wasn't. Lo and behold, it's stubborn lady Karen, looking annoyed as ever. As soon as I crack my door, the yelling starts and I'm almost blasted back as she tries to push my door open. I couldn't make out most of what she was saying, but I did hear the words lazy, brat, and millennial thrown in there. I'm pretty laid back and used to dealing with angry adults, so this doesn't irk me all that much, but when she pushed the door open, that started to tick me off. And then she started to talk in an understanding voice. Why isn't my lawn mowed? I need it mowed right now. Ma'am, it rained pretty heavily today and I can't mo I don't give a rat's butt what the weather is like. You better get your freaking butt out there. I have company. Ma'am, I'm not going to do your lawn. I didn't even mow my own today. Please stop harassing me. With her teeth clenched and her neck veins popping. If you don't mow the lawn right freaking now, I will report you like I should have done a long time ago. Now, while I could have argued, which I don't like to do, I thought of a better plan. <sighs> All right, ma'am, may I at least use my mower? No freaking way, you snot-nosed kid. I want my lawn exactly the way I like it. My plan was in action. So, grabbing her lawn mower and seeing that her and her companies freshly rained on fancy cars were all right on the edge of the lawn, I started to mow. I only got about halfway through before the mower completely shut down due to clogging and the sheer dullness of the blade, but it all worked out. Later that day, after a nice shower and a meal, I heard the reaction to my compliance, which was, to my amusement, the insane screaming and ranting about why the lawn was only half done and every car was caked in mud and grass. I only got in trouble with her, as none of my neighbors liked her very much, and of course she threatened again to report me to the non-existent HOA, to which I said, go ahead. And then, once and for all, I told her that I refused to mow her lawn ever again. An update, I would just like to add that the other neighbors are going super out of their way and pitching me a few dollars to help me buy a brand new self-propelled mower. Go neighborliness. My town has a horrible HOA Karen who actually tried to put a lien on my house. I never signed up for her stupid HOA, but she tried to pull some crap on me that I've never seen before. Last week, a letter arrived. A certified letter, no less. The kind that feels like it's carrying bad news. Never had those? Well, bad news it was. HOA Karen claimed that I owed hefty fines for violating obscure rules that no sane person could keep track of. 
Apparently, my front yard was an eyesore, my mailbox was too fancy for her taste, and my choice of paint color was a personal insult to her sensibilities, <laughs> or rather, lack thereof. Now, I'm not one to back down from a fight, especially when it comes to my house. So, I took her to court with evidence that I was happily outside of the HOA's grasp. It turns out, the overzealous Karen had mistaken me for someone else. A rookie mistake, but one that cost me days of stress and countless eye rolls. The courtroom became hot, and I made sure to highlight every single little stupid idiotic flaw in HOA Karen's argument. The judge listened, eyebrows raised higher than Willie Nelson, as I debunked her claims one by one. I could almost see Karen's self-righteous facade crumbling like the paint on her raggedy old fence. She had no ground to stand on. I swear she did it just because she didn't like me. Mistake me for someone else? Bullcrap. Maybe thought I'd back down out of fear or something. But nope, not me. Justice prevailed, and the court ruled in my favor, as they should. Not only was the lien promptly removed, but HOA Karen found herself on the receiving end of a fine for her baseless accusations. I mean, you can't just accuse people of stuff, right? And as the late great Billy Mays said, but wait, there's more. Word spread like wildfire through the neighborhood gossip grapevine. Karen was once the queen of the HOA and was now hated by everybody. The neighbors were once intimidated by her rule and showed her respect. They reveled in her downfall. It turns out, people don't take kindly to being ordered around even in the name of a homeowners association. From that day on, nobody looked at HOA Karen the same. Everybody wisened up to her tricks and stopped letting her walk all over them. I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? Somebody's going to try to take advantage of you if they think you won't fight back and make up some stupid crappy excuse, and then you do, and take them down. What have you done the same? HOA story time. You need to follow the law. Okay, no problem. By unintegrity. I live in an apartment block in Europe with about 100 apartments in total. Every year, we have an election for what could be compared to an American HOA, where we elect a president and a couple of board members to manage the general expenses and the daily maintenance task, like fixing the garage port, cleaning the common areas, security cameras, and so on. While we do have a rule book of sorts, nobody in the board has ever been too bothered by neighbors going their own way, as long as there's no complaints. I am the president of this HOA as of today, and I have had my fair share of interesting neighbors, but this one takes the cake. He bought a fancy Tesla, which he made an effort to flash around the neighbors, kinda condescending on how useless old cars are, how we live in the past. Thing is, we don't have a charging station in the garage, so he has to go to the gas station to fill up the battery. There was no charger when he came in, so that shouldn't come as a surprise here. But as soon as he got the car, he started pestering the board, asking about the EV charger. We need to keep up with the modern times, you know? We repeatedly answered that it's in our plans and that we would love to get him on board to help us, as he was the main interested person for the task. This should make the process much more efficient. He never responded to the invitation to join and to help. There's even a small payment for the board members, and we are slammed with other higher priority tasks that have suddenly popped up, like fire alarm upgrades, changing parts of the sprinklers, and so on, so we really cannot use much time in EV charging, although we all agree that we have to get that going. Suddenly, I got a phone call from an electrician reading from the law that we cannot deny an EV charger in the garage and that he would come the following week at our earliest convenience. I just asked him for some time to read the law and make sure that we were on the same page, and in the conversation, he slipped the name of the person who had ordered the charger. To no surprise, it was a Tesla man. There are others with EVs in the garage and we have a fluent communication with them about this matter. They prefer to wait and then work on the case, which is fine by me. So I reread all the laws and our internal regulations to make sure that we were following everything to the letter. It turns out that the law forces an HOA to facilitate the infrastructure for EV charging, not the stations themselves, as long as there is not a force majeure reading against it, like economical reasons. And our internal regulations state that changing essential infrastructure of the building needs to be done under the approval of the General Assembly, which happens once a year. 
I talked to our finance manager, and he argued strongly against such an expense without getting a loan to partially finance it, as it would destabilize the economy of the community. With all that, we decided to comply with the regulations fully. We won't decide on any structural changes on the building until the next General Assembly. We need a person dedicated to following the steps of finding providers, comparing offers, and presenting them first to the board, and then to the rest of the neighbors. This also includes safety measurements for the upgraded infrastructure. Once we have a budget, we will find bank offers for the loan that we will have to take, most likely, and then we need to hire a lawyer to update the rulebook to account for the use of chargers in the garage. As steps one and three are dependent on the General Assemblies, the process will inevitably be prolonged in time, and we know that the neighbors are generally against taking up a loan that will increase their monthly cost. So he will have to fight an uphill battle for being a pain in the butt. The best part of this is that before all this happened, we were considering setting a temporary charging station for everyone, instead of the ideal solution of everyone being free to set their charger on the spot. That would not require a loan and was planned to be done during 2022. Now, we will have to ask the assembly if this is an interesting way forward and abide by the response. I feel bad for the EV owners because when the Tesla guy invoked the rules, the game changed and now they have to wait for all the official process instead of having a temporary, just A-OK -okay solution while we got the rest in place. Do you agree with Mr. HOA president here or is he in the wrong? Let me know. This story takes place in an HOA. Entitled lady tries to take my surfboard after trespassing on private property by sack of memes. So to set the scene, I live in a very small beach town in North Carolina. We get a crazy amount of tourists in the summer months, but not quite as much as Myrtle Beach, a large city in South Carolina, one of the most popular on the East Coast outside of Florida. We get our fair share of naive tourists, and during my time as a lifeguard, I probably got asked 3,000 questions about sharks or jellyfish or stingrays in a day. Instead of saving people from the water, I spent most of my time telling people to stay off the dunes or telling people not to swim up to the boats. So anyway, the cast composed of myself, a naive entitled Karen Tourist, and her naive entitled Kevin Sun. So anyway, I saw that there was supposed to be some excellent surf one day and decided to head to the beach for a little shredding action. My beach access is part of a private neighborhood and it's paid for by my HOA, which means that it's private property. Once I get up to it, I see a middle-aged woman and her son, maybe six or seven, standing at the gate, holding floats. I think, great, I'll have a little arguing to do, because people are supposed to stay off unless they pay taxes for it to be maintained. So I walk up and the convo goes a little like this. Karen says, hey, uh, what's the code for this beach access? Well, it's a private access, I say. Are you visiting? I haven't seen your face around here. Where are you staying? She points to a house that isn't part of the HOA and it was developed after my neighborhood was. Oh, that house is part of a different neighborhood. That one uses a public access. See where the sidewalk is? Oh, come on, it's right across the street. Just tell us the code. No, ma'am, this access is paid for by our own taxes. There's a public access literally 50 feet to the left with no code. No, I demand that you let me and my son through or I will call the police. Go ahead. In the meantime, I'm going to use the public access. If you care to join me on the beach, then you can follow me on that access. I left her and her son red-faced like that, and then I walked to the public access. About 10 minutes go by, and I kind of forget about the pair. I'm putting wax on my board and waiting for my friend to show up in the meantime. I turn away from my board to head down and look at the water, and look for a good spot or a rip current. <laughs> and lo and behold, I see the kid trying to lift my board and his mom grinning at him. Keep in mind that my board is a 9-foot beast that has to weigh at least 50 pounds. My dad got it in Maui 20 years ago from a custom board store that's no longer open, and it cost at least $700 to $800. I run back up to the pair, and my usually good nature was out the window. Hey lady, get the heck off of my stuff. How dare you speak to me like that? I'll speak to you however I want to speak to you. Tell your son to just quit grabbing at my stuff. At this point, he had it fins up and was sitting on it, which is a massive no-no for surfing. It curves upward, and if you put too much weight on it, it might snap. 
I yanked it out from under him, and he fell forward into the sand. Get away from my son. I'm going to sue you until you need to file for bankruptcy. What the heck, lady? I'm defending my property. You can't sue me for crap. Freaking pedo, my baby just wanted to see it. He wasn't hurting anyone. At this point, her son is bawling, and he is screaming something along the lines of, Mommy, he broke my rib. Grow up, kid. Lady, don't touch my stuff again, or I'll call the police on you. At this point, a lot of people around me are angry at this lady, and I notice my friend has shown up and has a massive grin on his face. When I look away to make a face at him, the lady tries to yank the board out of my hands. I just let it drop. It falls onto her, and she buries her butt in the sand. I snatch it back up from her and jerk a thumb at my friend to run to the water. I turn to the kid, and I say, Don't turn out like your mother. I then turn and run towards the water with my friend and fill him in, and from what we can see from the waves, the lady is getting shamed off of the beach by the other beachgoers, most of whom knew me and knew I wouldn't fly off the handle unless it was something crazy. How would you handle Karen if you were OP? Holy crap, that's not good parenting, man. I say that as a dad. HOA president trying to remove my dog. My parents have been living in the same neighborhood for nearly 25 years. They own a condo. I had to move back to care for my mom as she had cancer. While she was recovering, my dog passed away. During this time, I had to deal with the HOA belittling me when I requested an exception to allow my truck during this extraordinarily difficult time. They rejected me via calling my dad and then emailing me that I am not the homeowner and cannot make requests. I complied and I never parked my truck here and I allowed my friend to borrow my truck in the meanwhile. I adopted a new dog for emotional support. She was a puppy mill mom rescue and, as such, required lots of training over the last four months. This included overcoming her fear of leaving the house. We sat in front of my house with toys and treats, and finally, one day, she was willing to go walk as several feet to the dumpsters in front of my house. And then the HOA president came up to me and asked me to move. I was polite and I explained the situation to her that I couldn't go to the public road because of my dog's fear. She was tearing up, asking me to have compassion for her children who play there, by the dumpster. I did get sassy and I told her that I have dung bags and the urine would be recycled through the nitrogen cycle. I mean, there's ducks, iguanas, and stray cat urine everywhere. Also, I see dogs walking there all the time. I was petty. I did send the HOA a complaint about the litter by the dumpsters, which was candy wrappers and toy gun foam bullets, and I did it knowing that it was the HOA president's children. And now, two months later, my dog walks fine on a leash on public road, but the HOA president has hit me with these emails on a Friday afternoon before the holiday weekend. The request is that I have 24 hours to remove my dog. And if I don't fill out accommodation paperwork, like for ESA and service dog, then she states that I'll have to pay $100 per day if the dog isn't removed, a demand to remove the dog by animal control via an attorney and to pay all the attorney fees. I had a dog for 18 years here before, and I'm not sure why they are using the standards of my dad's first contract from 25 years ago when they did not allow dogs in the neighborhood. The rules have since changed. I'm trying out one of these scammy ESA websites because I'm desperate, simply because my psychiatrist office is closed until after Christmas and I don't even know when I can get an appointment to see if she can help me. I did email her just in case. On the suggestion to contact a lawyer, we get the reply. I'm just wary because I live in Florida and I find the state laws often disagree with the HOA. I don't have the money to lose on getting legal with them and it's not my home, unfortunately. I feel bad because neither of my parents speak English well, so they're consistently following rules and keeping out of trouble. HOAs just freaking suck and I'm beyond frustrated. Would you stand up against the president or how would you take it if you were in this situation? HOA banned all e-mobility devices. So I own an apartment in a condo on the Upper East Side, 
I've had an e-scooter since I moved in back in 2016. I actually bought an e-scooter back then because of how far east the building is. It's about a half a block from the river. About a year ago, I got a letter from the building manager saying that anyone with an e-mobility device would have to remove it from their apartments and they could no longer be kept anywhere in the building. It was just a letter and there was no official change in the house rules of the condo, well, so I just ignored it. Well, this past October, I received an amendment to the building's house rules and there it was. No e-mobility devices would be allowed anywhere in the building and there would be a very large penalty of 1500 bucks if anyone was reported with one and $750 each time thereafter. A month after that, there was a board meeting at which time I made my case for an exemption due to the fact that my scooter is UL certified and I've had it since moving into the building. Well, I never leave it while charging and never overnight. I was shut down. I then made a presentation for the board going into detail about UL certified devices as opposed to the devices that are catching fire and how they are completely different. I even had the opportunity to meet over email the global director of UL Solutions who was willing to speak to my board about UL certified lithium ion batteries. They had no interest in learning about it and then once again shut me down. I then offered a concession suggesting that I keep the scooter in the bike room and purchase a camera to ensure that I wasn't charging it on the premises and that I'd only charge it in my office far away from the building. Got another no. So now I'm looking at going political on this one. I'll be meeting with an assemblywoman in my district about this situation and if an HOA can make these rules in direct opposition to city laws, which allow e-mobility devices and even encourage it for environmental reasons. I also discovered a bill that was passed a couple of years ago, which is called the Electric Vehicle Rights Act. The bill makes it illegal for an HOA to ban a unit owner from having a charging station in their unit. Now, it was meant for electric cars, but if an e-mobility device could be classified as a vehicle, then, well, I could make the argument that a charger for my scooter could be considered a charging station, and the HOA can't ban me from using it in my apartment. So there's now a bill being proposed by Senator Felder of New York, which makes it a requirement to register e-mobility devices as vehicles. I don't know if the bill will pass, but if it does, I believe I'll be able to win this fight. Are there any HOA lawyers interested in getting involved? I mean, buildings all over the city are banning these devices and people need to be educated on the truth about the devices that are UL certified or the ones that meet UL standards. This is a tricky one because this is a mobility device that people need to get around and if you ban it, some people are going to be in a whole host of trouble, especially if they have no other alternative. How would you handle it if you were in these shoes? I think my mom is being scammed and or discriminated against by the HOA. Please help. Posted by Guilty B 1562 My mom lives in a condo plex where she purchased a home several years ago, and it's managed by an HOA. When she first moved in, she said that the monthly fees were $240 a month, and then sometimes there are random special assessments. Last year, the complex came under new management, and since then, they have raised the fees to $400 a month. This year alone, she's already paid $10,000 in fees, and she just told me that they have intent to raise them again next year to over $700 a month. Now, I understand that there are always fees associated with owning a condo, but there's several reasons why I have issue with this. And the first is that the complex is not even that nice. It's very old, and it doesn't look like much. All of the outside of the buildings, as well as probably the inside, are completely outdated. The second issue I have with this is that from my understanding, the monthly fees are mostly to cover the maintenance for the various amenities in the complex. However, the pool has not been open for use at all this year, and she also said that the clubhouse has never been opened in the five years that she's been living there, except for the HOA meetings. So uh, what exactly are those monthly fees going towards? She also sent me a copy of all the charges that have been posted to her account since last year, and some of them just seem completely ridiculous, especially when taking into account that, I'm assuming in all fairness, she's not the only resident that has been charged with these outrageous fees. 
I found another unit in the complex that was listed not too long ago, and it says that the monthly HOA is 240 bucks, which is the original amount that she was paying, so I think it's a little suspicious. But my stepdad told me that the fees for each unit can vary depending on the size and the location in the complex. They sent out a letter with notice of the plans to increase the monthly fees, and they acknowledged in the letter that the community has been neglected for a long time. However, none of us are well versed in the inner workings of the HOA, and we all think that there's something more going on. I have tried telling my mom that she needs to talk to other residents, but she keeps to herself a lot and doesn't feel comfortable doing that. So I'm having to take matters into my own hands to help her with it. By the way, I also think it's worth mentioning that she's a single Asian woman and lives in a predominantly white neighborhood in Alabama. She's had two charges this year around 2,500 bucks. One says it was for electrical remediation and the other charge was a violation fine that she said was for peeling paint when she went to go help clean the clubhouse. Do you think that OP has any legal grounds for this? Let me know. HOA story time. No security light allowed? No problem. Posted by Jafay Brutus. Years ago, when my wife and I had purchased a home, the builder had told us that it might be part of an HOA, depending on how many homes that they ultimately constructed. We were among the first five buyers, so we pretty much had free reign to change what we wanted, via permissions from the builders, but those changes would be added to what was turned over to the HOA and for as long as we lived there, the changes could stay. The one change that we did add was a motion security light on the back of our fence, because my neighbor's kid would smoke MJ there and I didn't want to smell it sitting on my patio or when I had the windows open on nice evenings. Well, that went up my neighbor's butt sideways for whatever reason, and she refused to believe her kid would be doing that, even though it didn't point towards any other home, just the grass between my fence and the woods. It kept the kids from smoking the MJ there without calling the cops on something so foolish and petty. But since it was cleared from the builder, she couldn't do anything. Well, six months later, we end out with an HOA and she makes it priority one to get the lights. Several other neighbors followed what I did, whose homes faced the wooded area, removed. The requirement to get it changed since they were builder approved was 80% of the community, so the only votes to keep came from those of us on the back of the property. So we have to remove them being permanent changes. Not even three days later, her kid is again back there smoking the MJ. The HOA counter to why I had it was to call the police non-emergency number, but that's absolutely stupid to risk freaking some kid's life up because he wanted to smoke when that's an issue his parents, who, remember, don't believe he does it, deal with. So now I am pretty livid. This North American land whale cried to the point that I had to remove a cheap and non-disruptive fix. She refused to be a parent and keep her kid from impeding on us, and so now it's time for me to be petty. The next day, after her kid first went back there, I go out and I buy a 12-foot section of 4x4, wire, concrete, a large planter, and three 6,000 lumen floodlights, and build essentially a mini portable stadium light setup, rigged to the motion sensor, so whenever anyone passed by my fence, instead of being a small area immediately behind my house lit up, the sun came out to the woods with one light giving her home an x-ray. The first time her kid went back there, it was glorious. I got a picture of him with his device in hand before he skirted off so I could show her proof, and it sent her through the roof, getting those free x-rays. I showed her the picture, and she still didn't care, saying that if it goes off again, she'll call the police, and I was fine with it, because I told her that they'd see the same picture that I'd just shown her. In reality, they wouldn't, but Martha the manatee didn't know that, and I didn't expect her to try and call my bluff, which she never did. Just complain to the HOA. A lot. In the morning time, I'd lay the contraption down so it couldn't be seen, and raise it up after it got dark. About a week after this, I get a summons to the HOA meeting that's happening that week, and since it was disciplinary for my contraption, their lawyer was there and they want to hear the case. So I lay everything out, from builder to pictures showing how the original light didn't shine any brighter than the one on our porch, and it couldn't be seen from inside the homes. Her vendetta to change the HOA rules to suit what she wanted, and three of the five other neighbors who had to remove their security lights were also there to argue for getting them back when I went. 
After about 40 minutes, the lawyer comes back and pretty much said, well, Mr. and Mrs. Jaffe Brutus, you're right. This isn't a permanent structure, so it technically is allowed, but you can't have a light facing her property any longer. In addition, by the first of the next month, you will all be allowed to reinstall your smaller lights as they did provide a measure of security that benefits the property as a whole. So Martha the Manatee was blessed with another week of the sun on a pole and being mad about it. Those of us who lived facing the woods got our lights back, and after reselling the lights, I made most of my money back that I spent on supplies making that monstrosity. It was absolutely worth spending the few hundred dollars to out-petty a bad parent and insufferable neighbor. My HOA complaint inadvertently broke up an entitled mother's Karen's marriage by Munbeam19. Do dog moms count? This happened a few years ago, but I still think about it. After being blessed with great neighbors over the years, I then started taking it for granted. And then Luna, her four dogs, all the same breed, and family, two teens and a husband, move in the house next door. It started off well enough. Luna was friendly and the kids and the husband seemed nice. But she soon decided that the best place for her dogs to go potty was my backyard. I didn't agree, and after suffering in silence for a few weeks, I'm not very confrontational, I finally told her that my backyard wasn't her personal dog park. When they got home from work, they would let their dogs loose to go running in my backyard to play and go potty. One day, I happened to catch them and came out on my patio to tell them to cut it out. The dogs turned around and started running towards me while barking aggressively. Fortunately, her husband called them off before the little ankle biters got to me. And it wasn't just the dog that liked to hang out in my backyard. Luna liked to walk around my backyard while talking on her phone. One of the things I like about my house is the privacy. It backs the woods, so I don't have a lot of curtains on my back windows and doors. But since Luna liked walking around my yard, I was forced to curtail my habit of cleaning while scantily dressed. And it was creepy. Once, after it had snowed, I realized that someone had walked up to my back patio and had been peeping in my French doors. Not long after, someone left a gift of junk on my front porch welcome mat. Jeez, wonder who did that. But then, Luna seemed to want to repair our rather rocky relationship and asked me what time I got off work. We could do cocktails and hang out. I thought, whatever, Karen. So I told her, but no get-together ever materialized. I realized later that she just wanted to know what time I got home from work. What she didn't know was that I sometimes worked at home. On one of those days, I caught her once again letting the dogs loose in my yard. So I took a photo and I sent it to the HOA. I think she was also sneaking her dogs into my other neighbor's fenced backyard. The ramifications were swift. That complaint was the straw that broke the camel's back. The marriage was already on shaky ground, and the husband was tired of her and her dog hoarding. I only saw four dogs at the time, but there were more I didn't notice because they all looked alike. The next thing I knew, she and the dogs had moved back to South America. The kids went to live with relatives and go to college, and the husband was acting like someone who won the lottery. He always seemed somewhat grumpy before, but after she left, he was smiling and friendly. And then he bought a Harley, got a girlfriend, and proceeded to rid the house of copious amounts of urine-stained carpets. He was eventually evicted from the house, yes, they were renters, because the owners were sick of the complaints and the fines, and decided to move back in. Luna had apparently a gift for ticking off the neighbors on my block. The weird thing is that there were a couple of vacant lots and a dog park less than a block away, but apparently her neighbor's yards were the best place to take her dogs. I gotta know, do you agree with this comment? A lot of municipalities limit the number of adult dogs to a certain amount. Where I grew up, it was three. She's also lucky the dogs weren't shotgunned for their aggression on someone else's property. Threats from neighbors after I told them to remove their fence off my property. A few months ago, I told my neighbors that they had to remove their fence off of my property, which was two fence panels right next to our driveway, making it a very tricky situation for ever redoing our driveway if we would allow these fence panels and adverse possession. I told them to remove the panels after he was yelling and raging at me about our tree and that I better come on his property to rake the leaves. It sounded like an or else threat. I told him that I was not legally obligated to, however, he was legally obligated to remove his fence. He didn't remove his fence, and I received some abuse through text messages, and they started talking to neighbors, hoping for support. Fast forward to today, 
I asked in a nice voice when he was going to relocate the panels to his own property. He asked me why. I told him, well, because it's our property where we pay the taxes over, and after consultation, I was told he would need to remove the panels. I told him that my husband could help him. He went into a rage. He said that I had created an enemy and to better watch my back. He raged that my husband never did anything, that we didn't pay anything, that I didn't own anything because I'm not American. I stayed calm but firm and asked if this was a threat, that I wouldn't allow harassment nor discrimination, now I'm European with a green card, and that I didn't want them trespassing. More abuse and screaming followed that I made an enemy and them indicating that there would be retaliation. Oh, and that they had been good to me, after which I answered that threatening and screaming is not treating me good. And then he removed the fence. The fence is gone. I'm not sure if I should go to the police. We are getting more security cameras. In the past, he would always come on our property to inspect, asking me the names of my plants and if they were weeds, complaining that we didn't have window screens, and asking what my bee hotels were, complaining about our lawn and blah blah blah. For four years, I was always afraid that they would start code enforcement games. I mean, yeah, he says he's not going to do anything, but if you, if you ever have a neighbor with a track record like that, are you really going to believe him? Like, actions speak louder than words. I have had bad neighbors before. Wouldn't trust them as far as I can throw them, and I, I can't throw them very far. <laughs> what would have you done? This one is called Entitled Mother Tried to Steal My PlayStation, posted by Save Ferris Brother. This is the story of my cousin, who is the entitled parent in the story. Let's start with some backstory. When I was 17, I met the man who would become my husband. He was 18. I became really close with his older sister, who was divorced, and I watched her son, who was 9 when I met him, and 11 when this story takes place. He called me almost aunt, and I called him nearly nephew, and we had a great relationship. He always wanted to hang out with me, and I occasionally had him over to my parents' house for a sleepover, when his mom needed a break or whatever. He was very into video games, and so at one point I went out and bought a gaming system like his so he could play when he was over, and so I could get practice and get better at his favorite games. Hate to be schooled by a 10 year old, right? My boyfriend was away at a university about 4 hours away, and I was going home to community college and working almost full time. My sister had moved out and gotten married, and my parents had let me convert her bedroom into a sitting room for myself. I'd won a TV through a contest at work, and I moved my computer table and desk into there, and I got a second-hand couch from someone at work who was moving. The two rooms were connected by a bathroom, and I got a cheap dorm-type fridge for my birthday for my parents when I turned 18 to complete the room. It was a very cool setup. Alas, it was not meant to last. My cousin, dad's brother's daughter, was getting divorced and needed a place for her and her son, who was 10, to stay. We moved all my stuff into the unfinished basement. My dad threw up some temporary walls and a door to delineate my room, and they moved in. Kid in my room, cousin in my sister's room. I felt bad for Kay and tried to engage with him, but he wasn't anything like my nearly nephew. His parents were very religious and didn't let him watch much TV, play video games, or anything like that. I had some very G-rated games, no violence, that had come with my system, and his mom let him play those. He got hooked and would constantly go down to my room and want to play. Eventually, I moved the gaming system upstairs into a common area of the house so I could sleep in on weekends and not be constantly coming home to finding him sitting on my bed playing the game. It meant that I had to give up my gaming time, I had become a bit of a gamer chick, but I did end up getting more sleep and he seemed very happy. They were supposed to stay for three months and that turned into six and then nine. They finally moved out just a few days short of their 11th month anniversary with us on a Saturday. I was at work and then out with friends that night. The next day I slept late and decided to move some of my stuff upstairs. I cleaned and then enlisted my dad for some of the heavy lifting. When I was almost done, I decided to hook up the TV and went down to grab the gaming system. It was gone, along with a few of my games and both of my controllers. I texted my cousin. I said, do you guys have my PlayStation? Yes. Okay, but I didn't give it to you. I need it back. When's a good time for you to drop it off here? You haven't played with it in months. Kay had been playing with it, so I figured you wouldn't miss it. Understood, but I do miss it, and I want it back. But Kay enjoys it so much. He even bought two games for it with his birthday money. It's nice that he enjoys it. You should probably get him one of his own, but I still need mine back. It's not very ladylike for a girl your age to be playing video games anyway. It's not up to you to decide if I'm enough of a lady. It's not very ladylike to steal either, but here we are. 
There's no need to be rude. I'm not going to allow you to take his video games away from him. I'm not taking his video games away. You're returning my video games to me. He never actually had a gaming system for me to take away. He was using mine. You shouldn't have taken it in the first place. But he bought games for it. He used it all the time. As far as I'm concerned, you gave it to him. You never told us you'd want it back. You're the one who's trying to steal from a child. I'm coming up to my room all the time, so I moved it upstairs to my dad's TV. How is that giving it to him? I'm not arguing anymore. I want my gaming system back. She stopped responding after that. It took a few weeks, more text, and a phone call from my dad to her, a phone call from my dad to his brother, and me fighting with my parents who just wanted to let her have it but wouldn't buy me a new one. One controller was broken beyond repair and the other never really worked right, but the system worked fine. My parents were PO'd at me that I cut her out of my life after that, but I just kept telling them that as soon as she apologized, I'd forgive her. I'm still waiting. Am I the a-hole for wanting to name my son for a video game character? This was posted by Bluefykins8675309. Tommy Two Tones Jenny reference. All right, let's dive right on in. My wife is 26 and I'm 27 and we're both big gamers. We actually met through playing a game together online and it's important to us. We're expecting a baby boy in October and we couldn't be happier. This will be the first child for all of us and the first grandchild and sibling on both sides of the families. So they're pretty excited to meet him too. Here's where the problem comes in. My wife and I were both greatly moved by the story of Arthur Morgan in Red Dead Redemption 2. We consider him one of the best fictional characters of all time. I've been playing video games for a long time, and his story is the only one to ever make me cry. It was my wife who suggested that we use Arthur Morgan as the first and middle names for our son. I mean, not only would we be paying tribute to our favorite character, there's nothing wrong or weird about the names, other than Arthur is a little old-fashioned now, but it's not like we're naming him Sonic the Hedgehog or Donkey Kong, right? My mother had a brother that died when I was about a year old, so I don't really have any memories of him. She's been pressuring us to name our son after him. There's nothing wrong with his name either. It's pretty common think something like Robert John. It's just not what we wish to name our Sprout. My older brother let it slip to my mother that the name we chose was from a video game character, and she completely flipped out. She actually drove 30 minutes to our house so she could bang on the door and berate us in person for honoring someone who doesn't actually exist over her flesh and blood sibling. I understand that she still misses my uncle, and while this may be her grandchild, he is still first and foremost our son, and we already think of him as Arthur. That's going to be his name no matter how she feels about it. When we tried gently, and then firmly, to advise her that we respected her position, but that we weren't going to budge on ours, she walked out and told us that she would have nothing to do with our son and would never acknowledge him as family. Am I the a-hole for not making my mother happy and just giving her a freebie on this? I've actually always had a really good relationship with her, and it would hurt badly not to have her in my life or my son's life. My wife says that as parents, we're going to have to learn to advocate for ourselves because people are always going to be telling us that we've done something wrong and disagreeing with our parenting decisions. Well, OP, you are not the a-hole. She is. As a parent, as a father, this is despicable despicable. This is your child, not hers. It should be the name that you choose. Now, I understand that she is a little upset over the uncle, and I know that you didn't know him, but to say that she's not going to have anything to do with his life is just heartbreaking because that's her grandchild. I truly hope that she's just saying this out of anger and that you really work this out because this would just be not a good thing. So I hope all the best works for you, OP. And after each of these stories, comment below if I'm right or wrong and what you think about it. Am I the a-hole for telling my parents that I'll move out and their problems are theirs to solve, not mine? This was posted by ThrowawayDuh67. To start off, I still live with my parents. I'm 27, and my sister is 30, and my parents are in their early 60s. My parents are really bad handling money. My father refuses to retire and get a proper retirement fund because his job doesn't pay him enough. My mom has never worked a day in her life by choice, and that's okay. But both of my parents were always reckless with finances to the point that my sister and I had to play the accountant and help them not go bankrupt. My sister and I still lived with my parents till recently because we'd only decide to move out if we found a place together or moved out with our significant others. 
but renting houses in my area are very expensive, and we always held it off because we had other priorities that we needed to take care of first. Last year, my sister got engaged to her boyfriend, and she decided that she move in with him. When she announced that she's moving out, obviously I was happy for her, but my parents started yelling about how selfish she is for moving out while my parents need financial support for the house. Anyway, a fight broke out and my sister has gone no contact with them. After that, my parents have been mad at me too because I always defended my sister's choice to move out, saying she's a 30-year-old woman and allowed to live her own life. A couple months ago, I proposed to my girlfriend. I'm out of the closet since my teens and it was never a deal breaker for my parents. But when I proposed, all heck broke loose. My mom started accusing me of spending money on a stupid engagement ring instead of funding the house more. Now, I already help out with the house more than I can afford. And at that same time, I announced that I'll also start searching for houses to move out with my fiance. And then both mom and dad started calling me selfish for my sister for abandoning them when they have so many bank loans to pay off and how I'm selfish for moving out while they're going through such a hard time. While I might be the a-hole, I told them that it was their responsibility they're owing so much money to banks since they never properly took care of their finances. And because my dad refuses to retire and have a better retirement income, he stays stuck at a job that barely pays him a penny. I told them it's not my responsibility to always put my life on hold for their wrongdoings regarding jobs and financial troubles when they had the choice to avoid most of these. Now, they give me the silent treatment because I was not an appreciative daughter and I feel like I might be the a-hole, am I? Well, OP, absolutely not. See, at, you want to take care of your parents and you want to help them. They helped you all 18 plus years of your life, which is what they're supposed to do. It's not a special thing. It's what they're supposed to do. But at the same time, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. By what you're doing is enabling them, just continuing to fund that. There is a better way to go about this. They need financial education, but you cannot force this on them. Unfortunately, I have had to learn this and it sucks so bad. You want to change and you want to help people, but you just can't do it all by yourself. They have to want to make that decision to learn more. And it sucks it's your parents and it sucks to see, but there's only so much you can do for your own mental health and energy. You are not the a-hole, Hopi. I hope your parents get the help and you can be that positive influence on them, but ultimately it is their decision to better their lives and it might take hitting rock bottom to realize that, but sometimes that is the way. Unfortunate as may be, that's the way it goes. So, Opie, you are not the a-hole. Am I the a-hole for being shocked that my friend will get married before me? Posted by Outrageous Mind 7879. I have this friend, let's call her Jane. We're in our mid-30s now, but we were roommates since freshman year in college. She's one of my closest friends and I know her super well. And I know that for all of her 20s, she had horrendous luck with her love life and was extremely insecure about it. She always wanted to get married and have kids and kept ending up with douchebags who would cheat on her or men who just straight up didn't like her, daddy issues, and crying about it. And I was always there for her through it and reassuring her how she won't die alone but her love life kind of became a punchline in our group of friends, and sometimes she'd go along with it, especially once she got into her 30s and was still single. She'd say stuff like, <laughs> yeah, guys, we all know I'm gonna die alone all the time, and I know she was torn up about it, but we were always reassuring her that that's not the case, and she was in therapy about it. Anyways, about a year ago, she finally met an incredible man, and they fell in love almost instantly. He proposed to her last week, and she's just completely over the moon. I've never seen her this happy. This weekend, we all went out to celebrate, and all of our friends were saying how they're so happy for her after a long and difficult road, and it was really emotional. For context, I'm still single, no boyfriend, and, and I want to get married too, but I'm not a pathology like she was. And so I said, I can't believe Jane will get married before me. She started crying and stormed out, and the evening was completely spoiled. I tried calling her this weekend, but she was hysterical and said that I didn't have to point out that she's so unlovable, and it's a miracle she tricked someone into proposing. It's quite sad, but that's not what I meant, but that's her own baggage. I apologized, but also suggested that she should talk to her therapist about that reaction, and now she completely refuses to speak to me and won't answer my messages. A couple others in our friend group are on her side, and while some have said that she's overreacting and will come around, am I the a-hole? 